I want to thank everybody for staying with um, the program. The attendance has been really good for this course. Uh, actually, much better than the other ones. And um, there's a lot of sticking power. And of course, attachment is not something we're always looking for, but uh, in this case, it is. I mean, as far as staying with the course. Mm -hmm. um, and this, the subject that we're dealing with is is really quite advanced. So if um, if somebody would approach me and say, I don't really understand, you know, all these different <coughs> levels of jhana and these stage, these uh, super mundane stages that we're going to be talking about today, I totally understand because it's kind of a concept that uh, sometimes has to take, takes a, you know, how some things takes a while for them to kind of take hold. And then once they're, uh, once you kind of relax and, and see things, um, sometimes in a clearer light, then they're a little bit more easy to understand. But So it's very interesting, the, uh, uh, the jhanas. You know, you, you talk to somebody on the street about jhanas, of course, they would have no clue what you're talking about. I mean, because concentration is either on or, or off, you know, and we're talking about sustaining it, working with it, and in, in using different... Um, different meditation objects, uh, it, we will be today anyway. And so it's very interesting, uh, and I really appreciate everybody, everybody staying with the program. <clears throat> I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about a few things, and then we'll do a meditation uh, kind of halfway through, and then we'll, we'll kind of finish up uh, with some another uh, part of the book. So actually... Today we're, we're finishing up the book. Uh, the, I'm going to be talking about chapters 13 and 14. Um, so if you, um, I, I'm sure some of you have read the entire book. Some of you might not have, or might not be caught up to where we're at. I don't know. I'm just kind of guessing. And some of you might be right on. But uh, last week we went through chapter 12. And then this week I'll be talking about chapter 13 and 14. So... If you haven't already figured it out, I, I talk about the chapter ahead of time, and then and then you read it. And uh, there's two different ways we could do that. You know, we could, I could talk about the chapter, and then have you read the chapter. Um, but I, I guess what I, I feel like I'm doing now is kind of clarifying things so that when you read it, uh, it's a little bit more uh, easier to read, and you can kind of go into what we talked about. Um, so it's really about being engaged and, and me trying to get the, trying to clarify things, you know, before you read it, supposedly. And I say supposedly because I know some of you like to read ahead. I, I think I probably would. I don't know. But we, we talk about, um, uh, you know, momentary concentration and, um, and access concentration approaching jhana, and the, the word jhana is just another word for concentration. And so we know that in jhana, especially when we first get into it, there's still thought, and there's, there's joy and these kind of things that arise. Uh, uh, and then when we get, we, we get familiar with, uh, in even kind of control the jhana to a certain extent, we notice that this thought can subside. and um, and be more sustained. And even that sustained thought subsides itself and what's left is really kind of a, a solid kind of happiness and a joy. You know, this, what we're calling this PT and Sukha. And hopefully we've noticed that you can sit with that. Just the happiness by itself. And the more you sit with just happiness and joy, it's, it becomes even broader and bigger. You know, it, it like it, it's really a big part of the, the meditation. And um, it's really, I have to be really sensitive in talking about that because if you haven't experienced that, it's like you want to experience it and uh, it makes it tougher. You know, it's like, I want that so bad. And then when you want something, and you want to try to create it in your meditation, it doesn't work. So you just, ha you just have to let that happen. And then just a, a real light, there's a real light noticing 
and sometimes after the meditation, like, oh, that was really good. That maybe that's what they're talking about in, in jhana is this pleasure, um, and it 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 becomes amplified when the thought isn't there. Uh, and I think you can understand that. If, if there's a lot of thought in everyday life, there's some anxiety and there's some, there's some wanting this to be a certain way and maybe trying to fix that. You know, and I'm talking about everyday walking or working world or whatever. And then when everything is good, there's, uh, that thought subsides and we're happy. And that's basically what we're talking about in jhana, except it's, it's amplified by a hundred times or more. So we have this, you know, this joy and this happiness that comes about, uh, and then um, the the fourth jhana that we were talking about last week uh, is very much I'm noticing that I don't even that there, this happiness and this joy is not even needed, like it's too much, too much of a vibration. It's just kind of seen as a vibration. And then equanimity, you know, you become equanimous with everything. And that's when you notice that the, the pleasure and the pain in life is just made by the mind. And, it's, it, it, and it's, it's, it's like getting the joke, kind of. It's like, why was I always determining whether this was pleasurable and this was painful? You know, in, in every aspect of life. In, and we realize that we're, we're just like that ball in the pinball machine where it's drawn to that magnetic pole of things that are pleasurable and repelled um, from the bumper of, the, of the, the, the pinball machine, you know, like something that we don't like, this uh, unpleasantness. And so the, um, the, the pulling and the repelling loses its power, which is in life just becomes a, a flow. But it's seen through through the practice of the jhana and that's why it's so liberating for us you know to be able to dip into that to go through the first second third fourth jhana and then back out again is so liberating and so and it's so such a sign for us to realize that um, that uh, this this world can be so so freeing and so liberating and of course, what we're talking about is the, the material jhanas, the, this, the, in a material form in our life, which is pervasive in our life. I mean, when we look around and we hear, smell, feel, even think something, it has to do with this form within the world. And that's why these, these first four jhanas are called uh, the form jhanas. And so even when we're deeply, deeply concentrated, it's still related to, to the world. It's worldly, worldly form. Even when these worldly, when this worldly form seems to, seems to not be there, the pleasure arises because the form um, is set aside but it's still there. So these jhanas are still related to the, the world of form. And the next four jhanas um, are form, they're called the formless jhanas, are rupas. Rupa uh, in the Pali, uh, the Pali language means form. A rupa, a rupa means no form. It's like the word nata means self, and anatta means non-self, no self. So rupa is everything that you know we could see, hear, smell, taste, and, and generally, and think about too. When we think about our loved ones or think about uh, our vacation, it has to do. These thoughts have to do with form, don't they? It, it's. Even if we, you know, the mind is incredible, we can think about going to the moon, but the moon is form. It's like going to a, just a different form. And what I mean by that we can think of going to the form, it's it, to, to the moon. Uh, the, the mind, you know, they say the speed of light, but the mind is much faster even than the speed of light. 
we can think of we can think of the moon and we're there just like that, can't we? But it's still form. And so the, the immaterial jhanas are um, the subject of chapter 13, you know, what we're going to be talking about here, and then chapter 14 is the uh, super mundane uh, stages of enlightenment. So I thought maybe we would talk a little bit about the immaterial jhanas and then um, we'll take a little, just a, like a five minute break and then we'll do some meditation, do some meditation and then talk about the um, different stages of enlightenment, which are a very interesting topic. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any questions? And kind of loosen up the atmosphere here a little bit and see if anybody has any questions about the, 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 the jhanas in, in, in particular. Um, because uh, I know when, when we, we the, the book is clear, but there might be some things that, that could be clarified even a little bit more. Is it because of the different kinds of pleasure, or...? Maybe, yeah. yeah. I just, for some reason, <coughs> lost. I mean, maybe it was the week I was in here or something, but... Um, the, 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 you say the second, the second, second and, and third, third yeah. Like, I feel like, you know, the first is that, you know, entry kind of point of that, you know, joy and pleasure feeling, and then it kind of, um, that even drops and just becomes equanimity. And the fourth jhana is kind of like the second and third are kind of... Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, the the jhana factors um, are uh, applied. Uh, there's an applied thought and sustained thought, and then the, the and then the joy and blissfulness, and then single pointedness. Those are the five jhana factors, and the, and therein, all of these are found within the first jhana. After we go through the first jhana, that um, applied thought is is not there. And um, the sustained thought um, is still generally found in, in the second jhana. But in the second jhana, there's um, the, the, the happiness, the joy, and the blissfulness are, are very prominent. Um, and they're really the, the primary factor. And it, it is said, and it, it, this isn't necessarily carved in stone, but it, it's said that the second jhana, with that, with that, with the thought subsiding, the blissfulness or the the joy is just so much. Uh, it's such a heavy vibration, and it, and it's um, it's very prominent in the second jhana because the, the thought has subsided so much. And then when you get into the third jhana, it's, we go into the third jhana because that, that vibration is too much to hang on to. So joy is prim, the, the primary ingredient, this um, joy that we can hang on to and sit with for a long, long time is, is prominent in the third jhana. And so thought is almost, we could say that thought is, is, is extinguished. And it's just joy and single pointedness. So we're dropping we're dropping these jhana factors every time we go through, and then um, and then when we get into the fourth jhana, it's just single pointedness in which uh, it, it's it's as if we're adding another factor, but it's just equanimity. It's nothing that we can really add, but that's that's the state is is equanimous with everything because of the single pointedness. Um, because the joy isn't even even needed, it, it's not. It's it's as if um, even the joy is too much. Yeah, that, helps. that helps. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're dropping we're dropping these factors each time, and um, I think we mentioned that like the layers of an onion, or we're peeling away these different things, and and you know it's it's when you first hear that oh we're peeling away. Sustained thought, you know, like like that's a big part of the concentration, the sustained thought. But then, in, in, but that that seems gross, and then that 
that's pulled away, and then there's just happiness, you know, blissfulness. It's like, okay, this is it. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I, I found what I've been searching for all my life, you know, this mm -hmm. happiness. And, and, then, and then that's too much. And we actually peel that away. It's like um, getting tired of a new toy or something. And then what, what's left is that equanimous, uh, that equanim um, equanimity. <coughs> and the, the Buddha said, in, in talking about the fourth, sitting in the fourth jhana, the Buddha said, well, that's, you know, you, you don't have to go any further, but there is more. And that's peeling away the, uh, uh, the, material, uh, the material form. And some people have a tendency to go there, and some people have a tendency to, to um, just fully emerge themselves and understand the world of form and not have that, that this world of form interfere with, with their lives and their, their practice. Because, they, because it's figured out, basically, that you know, the analogy of the ball, <laughs> you know, being Pull the pinball machine ball being pulled to this magnetic stuff or being repelled. It, it's, it's completely figured out. Yeah, um, you know, I hope the camera's working this morning because your talk that you give this morning, I'd sure like to listen to. Uh, I hope it's working. The light's blinking. Time, you know? yeah. um, but I, it really struck me because um, I'm still in the seeking joy of avoiding pain mode, um, but, you know, getting a joke, um, that's a strong, when you just get past even that, you know, that's... Even if it's momentarily, it, it's life changing. Huh? Yeah. Because the question I was going to ask, and this is a little off topic, but most people, let's say, um, in order to, to achieve joy, they produce material stuff. They, you know, and so they manifest material things for achievements or whatever. And and perhaps that's what makes this world, quote unquote, a better place. When we get to a place where we can achieve far more joy than these manifestors of the world, just by sitting still. Um, you know, we, we don't have to, we don't have to manifest to, you know, be okay, well, the world's going to move a little slower, isn't it? You know, I, I just, I wonder about that. So I won't be manifesting as much. Uh, I don't know, I, perhaps everyone has a path. You're manifesting a lot of things, and this is a path we'll forget. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> you know, the world... Uh, the the world of form, you know, it's it's we can't get away from it, <laughs> basically. But when we have it figured out, it becomes so much more um, meaningless and meaningful at the same time. Really, it, it, especially you know, just the way you're ex explaining it and expressing it. Um, the um, I, I I believe that you know there is manifesting. Um, and um, especially when we look at the gross aspect of, of what everything is, uh, manifesting could be quite easy. And it is. I mean, when we want something, we usually get it. Uh, and um, and if, if we, especially when we don't get involved, and I'll kind of touch on this a little bit more, but when we uh, understand what this ma material world is all about. Um, I don't want to use this, the term. I don't really. I didn't come here to talk about supernatural powers, but it's it's um, beyond the world of form and um, and how um, how we can get beyond form but also work with form very, very easily and very uh, smoothly. Um, it's said in some traditions that the most important thing 
And the biggest lesson that we get out of this whole life and this whole thing that we're working with is the, the single moment, the thought that we have right before we die. And if, and if we think in terms of that thought right before we die, how meaningless all of this form is, how meaningless it has been. Um, we don't, when, we, when we're uh, in the hospital, chances are we will probably die in a hospital. Um, and our, some of our loved ones will be around us. And, um, you know, unless we die uh, at 99 years old or whatever, you know, there'll likely be, you know, a, a quite a few of friends and family around. And we're not worried about that new car, you know, we're not worried about, you know, whether we're going to get the house painted or anything like that. And we're not really worried about form, except we could be worried, uh, there could be a, a, just a, a spark of worry about some pain within the body, that's form. Um, we might be concerned about leaving our loved ones, that's form as well. But if we can somehow uh, transcend that right before the moment, um, you know, the last moment of, of death, um, it, in uh, the Buddhist tradition anyway, that's enough to really, really change um, our direction, you know. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that in, in depth here. Um, after our medita after our meditation, but um, yeah, the you know getting getting the joke is a is a huge thing, um, especially when we see that we understand that these this material stuff isn't what's going to re actually make us happy. You know, any of it, relationships, this body, you know. We work a lot to keep this body conditioned, which is what we should do with it, but sometimes we're just, uh, we, we overdo it, and if it doesn't work out the way we want it to, we're sad, you know, we become really sad, and really depressed. And um, that's, that's the world of form, that's the trickery of the form. And it's just, and the reason I say trickery is because it's impermanent. It's just here and there, here and there, gone, rises and gone. In, rises into our consciousness and, and, and flows away, just like that. So, um, the immaterial jhanas are a little bit harder to, um, to grasp a hold of, and it's really a challenge for anybody to explain them because they're immaterial and they're beyond words. So we're using words to explain word, the wordless, right? And but uh, Bhante G does a great, uh, a great job. Out of any, all of the books I've read about Jhana, he um, he does the, uh, the most clearest uh, and uh, penetrating job in explaining the formless uh, Jhanas that I know of. And there's not a whole lot of books out on Jhanas. If you go to um, Amazon.com and and type in Jhana meditation. You know, just a handful of books will come up, as opposed to typing in mindfulness. You know, a whole you know a thousand uh, choices will come up. So this is a this is a real treat, and and it, and it's uh, knowing the book makes my job quite a bit easier too, as far as explaining the unexplainable. <laughs> so it's a real challenge. So the the immaterial. Uh, world is is very freeing and, and very limit uh, very um, uh, of course it's limitless and to understand that limitless is to uh, really penetrate it in such a way that we have to be uh, concentrated we have to be relaxed we have to to be able to um, understand the different uh, peeling away the different layers of the material jhanas in, in order to get into the immaterial jhanas. But even if we don't get into the immaterial jhanas, um, the Buddha said it really doesn't matter, but it's a, it's a choice. It's a completely a choice. If we want to try to go into this area and dip into this area through our, our uh, meditation. 
Um, and the, the, the immaterial jhanas, is, is, it's not peeling away the jhanic factors like we were doing with the material jhanas. But it's, it's pointing our um, awareness, our, our focus on different uh, meditations, uh, meditation objects or objects of meditation, objects of concentration. The very first one is the, the base of unbounded space. And when we think in terms of, of space, um, we, a lot of times we think of the galaxies. You know, we think of looking up into the sky at night and seeing space. But what are we seeing? We're seeing, um, we're seeing light because we're looking at the stars or we're looking at something that is in the background of this, this limited space, you know, like an airplane. The other night I was looking at the, I, where was I? Someplace kind of out of the city. Oh, I was, I, uh, I was hiking at the, hi, 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 not, 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 not the petroglyph trail, but the hydroglyph trail over in, in the, uh, in the McDowell Mountains, or not the McDowell Mountains, the <laughs> Superstition Mountains. Yeah. And there's a huge parking lot there. And uh, we came down, um, we got a late start, so we came down and it was completely black. We were hiking in the dark and there was nobody around, so it, uh, we just sat in the middle of the parking lot and looked at the sky for a while. And so when you're removed from the city, you know, you can see a lot more, <laughs> and, you know, more stars and more things and some of these, some of the lights look like the airplanes way, way up high and some of them actually look like possibly satellites, you know, uh, different kinds of lights. And, and so, uh, you know, I found myself looking into <coughs> space, but I wasn't looking into space. I was looking at, I was looking at the lights, you know, the twinkling lights. So I, I was drawn to form and that's how, that's how it is for us. We are drawn to form. And, but the space that we're uh, talking about in the formless realm is, the, the key word is the boundless space. So if we, if we take our world, what we, th we think is our world, and if we can somehow <coughs> ball it up, you know, the, the galaxies. There's two different ways of looking at this. One way is to to take everything and ball it up in a way, such a way, and then um, put a sheet over it all. You know, so er all of the form in our world, it just throw a sheet right over it, or what uh, the book calls a casino. Um, so we're, we're, we're covering it all up. And then what is outside of that sheet? That's the space that we're talking about. And that space is not limited by anything. It's just complete boundless. Another way of looking at it or experiencing it, I don't want to say looking at because we're, 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 we're trying to get a concept of, of, uh, of formless, is that if we were suspended in space as, as a as a being, um, and we've seen pictures from astronauts and the, the Hubble, you know, taking pictures of the Earth and taking pictures of stars and different galaxies. But Im imagine being suspended in space, but there is no Earth and there is no star, there is nothing to look at, it, just space itself. And so there's a, there's a being uh, suspended in space, but nothing to draw our attention, nothing to view, nothing to see, and there's no boundaries to any of that. Completely limitless. To understand that limitlessness is that boundlessness. Um, some people make the mistake of meditating on... Um, Bhante G actually talks about this in the book like a keyhole or a uh, container that is filled with space. Some people even use a, uh, a bucket with water in it 
and, and imagine the vastness and, and, and look into the water and see, see the vastness of, um, of, the, of, of, of unlimitlessness in that water. But the trouble is that there's a container that's holding that, so it's not limited. Because limit, limitless is limitless, completely limitless. And so when we think in terms of unbounded space, it's completely unbounded. And which is actually a part of our true nature. The only thing that is limiting our awareness is that we think that there's limits to it. So when we're sitting in meditation and we go through this thought and the thought disappears, the joy disappears, the happiness disappears, and uh, we're sitting in this single-pointedness uh, this world of, of form, and when that world of form disappears, it's just vast, open space with no boundaries. Boundless space. No material at all. So we're transcending, I'm going to look at my notes here a little bit because I, I don't want to forget anything. So we're transcending the, the, the world of form altogether. And if you can imagine, this is something that can happen on its own. But again, like the other, like the material John is, there's very little control over it. So we, um, if we can find a way, and it's a little bit different for everybody, if we can find a way to, to understand this at a deeper level. Because when our concentration is real good in the, in the material jhanas, getting into the immaterial jhanas, um, the, 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 the power of this relaxed concentration is at such a depth where we can, we can sink into this um, boundless space and just sit there. I'm going to read a little bit from the book here. This is from uh, one of the sutras. Um, and this has to do with um, like the, the analogy of the sheet that I said that we, we bring all the, this material form together and we cover it with a sheet. Okay? And it says here, when, when, he, is re, uh, when he is removing it, he neither folds it up like a mat or withdraws it like a cake from a tin. It is simply that he does not advert to it or give attention to it or review it. It is when he neither adverts to it nor gives attention to it nor reviews it, but gives it his attention exclusively to the space touched by it and regards that as space-space that he is said to remove the casina, or to remove uh, what I call the sheet. And um, so we're taking all the material form, we're covering it with a sheet, and we're, we're, we're removing that and just having complete uh, unbounded space, like a vastness. And what happens is we realize that all of this material form is just a part of the mind. It's just created by mind. So we close our eyes and um, we completely uh, set aside, if we can set aside completely the world of form, we realize that this immaterial form is really, really our true nature. That we, we bump into this form and, and this body is, is form and, and, and it, we're like a kid in a candy store, actually. But it, it, because it, it's so subtle that 
when we get away from that, even our dreams, we dream about form, don't we? We dream about, you know, flying or about the trees and, and all sorts of things that we dream about, but it has to do with form because our, the mind is so conditioned, you know, to be drawn to this form. Okay, the, now, we think of what would be beyond, <laughs> what would be beyond this, this vast space, what could be beyond that. And, again, the analogy, let's say we're floating in space and we, we, uh, we don't see the earth, we don't see the stars, we don't see anything. What could be, uh, we could say, deeper than that as far as the meditation experience or the, the jhanic experience? is that we realize that we are simply, there's just consciousness being aware that there's space. It's just the consciousness itself, or what we could call, some people are uh, a little bit more settled with the, the um, and understand the word awareness. So I'm using the, the word awareness and consciousness as meaning the same thing. So there's, there's an awareness that there's Space, just vast space. Not space. So the space itself is gone. It's just the awareness itself that there is space. Okay, everybody understand what I'm saying? So when we when we med- we can meditate in this area by um, kind of simply using that as a mantra, if we if we like, that there's awareness, awareness, awareness. And um, eventually that will soften and we don't, we don't have to remind ourselves of awareness, awareness, awareness. Uh, because it's so, so subtle. But it, it's just a pointer for us to understand that the space, this idea of space is just created by, by somebody who's being aware very, very subtle, or just being conscious that there is just space. Boundless space, not, not space contained in anything, just boundless, limited, limitless space. And that's, that's the uh, second aruba, or um, arupa. And let me see, I'll read a little bit about that here to see if I can explain. Now, the, the second arupa in the book, the statement is, by completely surmounting the base consisting of boundless space, aware of boundless consciousness, he enters and dwells in the base consisting of boundless consciousness. So this consciousness itself uh, is no, no longer related to the space. Consciousness itself Within within the world, so that space that we're that we were referring to is is almost is uh, almost seems uh, like it's a, a part of the form. It's very cl- very closely related to form because we're just removing the form out of it. But then there's a realize it's understood that the space is not even there. It's just consciousness itself. Not even our consciousness, just consciousness, just awareness. So we're refining, refining, refining. So our, our, our uh, uh, meditation object is no longer boundless space, it's boundless consciousness. Okay? You understand why it's difficult to explain this stuff? Because <laughs> we're using words to... Uh, to it, Right. Yes. Yeah. Inus. Yeah. Then what could be? What is a? Uh, what is a deeper level from that? What could possibly be deeper than 
because we're only in the second uh, arupa. In the third, uh, <laughs> so where you have to, there's, there's still more, there's still something deeper there, right? So we, uh, when there's a realization that there's a boundless space, and then just boundless consciousness or boundless awareness. In other words, awareness, there's an, like an awareness being aware of the awareness. I don't like to use two words, one word to describe another word, but, it, but that's what it seems like. Awareness, watching awareness. And then the third arupa is the arupa of, uh, and this is a term that we hear a lot in Buddhism, is complete emptiness, unbounded um, emptiness. So there's not even, if... If there's consciousness or awareness, and it's not our consciousness and awareness, just consciousness and awareness of everything, and we remove that label from that, it's empty, completely empty. Poof. Everybody just vanished. So it's a voidness, or what is called sunita in uh, the Pali language. It's a... It's a uh, the uh, boundless, it's nothingness. We could say nothingness. And this is what, um, how this is expressed. Uh, this little writing here from one of the sutras. By completely surmounting the base consisting of boundless consciousness, aware that there is nothing, he enters upon and dwells in the base consisting of nothingness. And these, these are areas that we can, a person could sit in for a long, long time if they wanted to, because there's, there's, there's no body, no body, there's no form to have pain, and there's no form even sitting, you know, it's just complete nothingness. And believe it or not, this is something that we experience, just a, you know, just a, a flash, and then we our consciousness comes back, you know, there's, then there's something there. Because we're dra so drawn to form, this form is so compelling for us, because we think it's so much, so real, and so much a big part of our world, but when we start dipping into these formless areas, and having even a little bit of control, it's like, oh, you know, it, it blows the whole, the whole top off of everything, you know. So the boundless space, boundless consciousness into nothingness, what could be, there's still one more level. <laughs> so what could, be, what could be deeper than this nothingness, this, this space of, of emptiness? Because there has to be, in order for there to be that label of emptiness, that nothingness, there has to be something that perceives that there is emptiness, that there is nothingness. So, the next, uh, the, the final uh, arupa, the final j uh, jhana, um, what is often called the eighth jhana, or the fourth uh, arupa, is uh, neither, neither perception or non-perception. There is nothing perceived, no perceiver, uh, no perceived, even emptiness itself is not even perceived. And it's like, um, I guess it's like checking out. <laughs> you know, checking, uh, when a person goes into these levels of jhana, the, there's a, you, uh, you want to set. You want to tell yourself how long you're going to. Um, you're not telling the self anything, but you want to um, put out a conscious effort of how long you're going to be meditating, and then when you come to that that spot, then you come out of it. You meditate for an hour. And after that hour is done, then you come come through these these layers of jhana and then come out of the jhana. So we're talking, uh, you know, about a very very deep practice um, and it's um, it's so deep um, that there's some very very mysterious things that have happened to 
these people that have mastered the jhanas in such, a, such an extent, um, particularly those of that um, have decided that uh, that they um, that their time is done, so they go into jhana and they actually they actually do um, pa pass on, um, and they uh, they found. Um, um, I can't remember the name of the monk in Thailand. Uh, he did. He did just that. He went through the all the way to the eighth jhana, um, and uh, his consciousness never returned. I mean, it's not that this is dangerous. It was a. It was a choice that he made. Um, that uh, he, he his body didn't decompose for. Um, well, it's still there actually. Um, so the uh, consciousness had left the body. I had, didn't plan on talking about any of this, but the consciousness uh, had left the body, uh, but the body is still um, still sitting there, basically. And they um, they put it. Uh, there's no there's no sign of really any life within the body, and they put it in a glass case. You can probably find information about this online. And they put it in a glass case, and it's it's still. It's still there, <laughs> still sitting there. They've another uh, report is that the some of the monks in Tibet that had um, mastered the jhanas had gone into some of these caves, and um, the bodies were found in the caves, uh, and in their sitting in their meditation postures, and they they left the body basically. They were found by, um, um, I guess the reason, supposedly the reason they did that is because the, uh, the Chinese were coming in and, and um, they realized that they, they don't have to, to put up with the, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it the invasion of the Chinese. Uh, so they just went up into the caves and went into jhana and then never uh, came back again. You know? And their bodies were found. And, a bunch of monks sitting in the. And the body didn't decompose. No, no. The the um, unfortunately they were. Um, it's kind of bizarre, but I, I guess the. They were yeah, the bodies were kind of destroyed, you know, by the the soldiers that found them. Don't want to go into details, but. But the. Um, you know, this, so this stuff is possible. People have done it. Um, when you talk to somebody that has mastered the jhanas, they talk about it like it's no big, no big deal. Um, after a while, <laughs> when they for, when they for, uh, any of the jhanas, when you first go into them, it is a big deal. Um, and you want to call your meditative friends and uh, talk to them about it and say, this is what happened. Then after a while, it, it, it isn't that... Uh, that amazing, and that's why a person progresses through different jhanas. Like I said before, it's like finding, kind of getting tired of that new toy, you know, that new, that new state. You know, it's it's like a, a fifteen-year-old boy, you know, discovering a new, you know, new girl in class or something like that. It's just exciting, and, and after a while, you realize that she's just human too, or whatever, you know. And um, so the jhanas are. Uh, they're, they're real, and um, they're uh, act, you know to practice and getting into them. Uh, it does take a lot of practice. It takes mainly, I would say, time. And uh, the, at my place, we used to do uh, three-hour meditations once a week, and and for a lot of people, that was when they were really starting to experiment experience the jhanas and start to work with them, uh, three-hour meditations. And, that, and in many cases, that's what it takes. And I'm not saying that to, to discourage anybody, but I'm saying it to encourage, encourage you to, uh, you know, maybe lengthen your meditation experience. And, and um, the primary thing is to keep it consistent. So when you're consistent with your practice, then the body conforms and gets used to it, and then you just sit longer and longer. Can you just clarify when you said 
started talking about the, um, the Uru books, um, you had said that there's some people use the meditation object, like you were talking about the water, but it's not necessary either, right? Uh, well, there, there has to be... You, you noticed I didn't talk about the breath anymore. Right. I haven't talked. I haven't mentioned the breath since we sat down, and the reason being is because the object, the breath, is so gross at that time. You know, to for somebody that is dipping into these jhanas to think that I'm going to be focusing on the breath, it, it just it's just not there because because there's a knowing, you know, that there's a knowing in the meditator that this stuff is absolutely possible and there's when that doubt is erased it's huge it's absolutely huge and um, I'll be talking about more about what once about how important it is to erase all of the doubt in our life and in our practice because it changes everything and the doubt is because there's somebody that doubts. I can't even, I'm sorry, I don't even remember your question, if, but I, was it related? Well, because you talk about um, meditation objects, some people use the bowl of the water, but it doesn't really work. Yeah. And then you had also started off talking about it, about it's a choice if you want to continue. Yeah. And is it really like something, you know, you have to make a choice on, or it can just happen, if you're that's chosen a good, to sit long enough and practice long enough. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think if a person has the time, especially in a, like in a, man, a monastic situation, I would say, and if they go through the material jhanas, I think the natural inclination is to go into the formless. We'll just call it the formless realm, you know, because it is it is there, and um, or it is not there. I guess we could say too, but it um, there's a kind of a natural uh, inclination to to go in there and just to rest in the in the formless. Right. So the choice really is about your practice in general. Yeah. My how, choice now is I'm going to, you know, uh, how how. What are the depths that we want to go? Yeah, that, because some people just. That choice becomes subtle. Well, there's there's like a gateway, you know, between between the material realm and then and the and the immaterial realm um, for the meditator, and and it's there there is a there is a choice, and but you know a person. When you get into the fourth jhana, there's a really clear understanding of what the formless realm is all about, and if, and if a person you, you could, a person, I would go so far that most people that get into the fourth jhana dip into the formless, in the immaterial realm, and um, kind of dabble in it, and then the choice is kind of like you know is this necessary or is it not necessary? I think it's really it's the inclination of the person. Because there is a feeling that this is this is our world, and this is where um, we should stay, stay, work with and stay at this time. Um, and once uh, you can you can work with the form and know that it has no bearing on being happier or being unhappy. It's just there, you know, for um, for to be used in any which way we want to use it. Um, so, the, so do I want to you know, use this form and uh, actually um, use the form to help others and help and, and clarify you know, the, this existence of this stuff? Or do I want to go into the formless and, and dabble into the formless? And for some, for some people, it, it's just seen as completely not necessary. This whole train of thought is af not when you're in jhana, of course, but it's when you're outside of jhana. Because the clarity comes. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, penetrating, very penetrating. It's clear. Everything becomes so crystal clear, and um, it's, it's life-changing. Mm -hmm, thank you.
So let's take a little break and then um, just kind of stretch and then we'll do a meditation and then we'll talk about enlightenment. <laughs>